It's funny, I can't. I, Welcome. Hello, my name is John Sproul. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and welcome to everyone. Uh, all pronouns, all strangers, all non-strangers, and all those in between, the familiar strange ones, which often frequent these halls in the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. I will be joined by uh, someone who is not a stranger, our minister, Rosemary Morrison, or as we refer to her, Reverend Rosemary, and we hope that you feel welcome here. Uh, the service is titled Change, and we hope it will be exciting and life-changing for you all, at least for a bit for the next hour. I'd note that we are one of two Unitarian Universalist uh, churches in Edmonton. We're the UCE, and the other congregation is the Westwood Church on the south side, and we, who are our colleagues and friends. Uh, uh, anyone new, try us both out, and hopefully you can find something that might bring you back to either congregation. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, religious, multi-generational community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritual questing individuals, joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, pursue the common good, and work for justice. We believe in the compassion of the individual heart, the warmth of community, and the search for meaning in our lives. We gather with great gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we all be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. And so as we begin this special hour together, I invite you to quiet your devices. You don't have to quiet yourselves. We'll get you. And, and oh, that's after. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, and uh, you can all enjoy the service um, together. Um, may we be reminded here of our highest aspiration and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. Now we have a couple of announcements. One first, John Turpin has an announcement and then Reverend Rosemary, so John. Oh, I think I said name wrong, sorry. John has an announcement. Great first name, by the way. Yes, I, I, do, I do agree, absolutely. Hello, as mentioned before, my name is John. John Turvey. Um, I'm, oh. I am one of three current endowment trustees. We want to take this opportunity to remind people that UCE does have an endowment fund. It was set up more than 20 years ago and is governed by our bylaws. My announcement this morning is to alert you uh, to some great opportunities coming up in the first week of October. During Wills Week, which is October 2nd to 6th, there will be free presentations on a variety of topics related to wills and estates. These are professionally delivered and sponsored by the Edmonton Community Foundation. The endowment trustees think these are great opportunities for us all to learn more about how to get our estate arrangements in good shape. As they say, you can't take it with you, but you... <laughs> But you can, through your will, make it easier or harder for those left behind to follow your wishes. <laughs> wink, wink. Look for details in your coming October newsletter and see me if you have any questions about the UCE Endowment Fund. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next time I go before John. <laughs> Hard act to follow. <laughs> Thank you, John. I have two things I'd like to alert you to. So tomorrow evening at Brewster's in Unity Square is an opportunity for us to gather in a social, relaxed atmosphere and be waited on and somebody else do the dishes. And all we have to do is show up and visit with one another. And um, so it's 
come as you are. I'll be there around 5.30. There are, uh, we're changed the time. It used to be like 6.30, but the specials end at 6. So <laughs> we're gonna, I'm gonna be there at 5.30 and take advantage of that, and I, I invite you to do that as well. The second thing that I'd like to talk about this morning is Soul Matters. You may have seen that um, one of our facilitators, Pauline Atwood, was at the back and she had um, pamphlets or um, the Soul Matters packet that you could take and there's sign-up sheets for you if you wish to take part in the Soul Matters small groups. These groups follow the monthly theme, so we are doing theme-based ministry through Soul Matters. It's, a, it's an organization, a UU organization. So this month is Welcome, and next month is Heritage. And so this, the small groups will be following along with those themes as we also explore them here on Sunday morning. It allows you to get to know one another a little better. It allows you to have a conversation about some of the things you've experienced and learned. And at, so you get a packet, everyone gets a packet with their newsletter at the beginning of the month. It goes out to everyone that gets the newsletter. So you just click on it and you, and you get the, the monthly packet. Some people say they don't know where to find it. It's on your newsletter. And we're gonna start putting it on the weekly emails as well, a link to the Soul Matters packet. So, we invite you to learn about it, to join a group. We've got two groups going right now, two online. If there is interest, we will have an, a third group that may meet in person, unless we're in a blizzard or something like that. Does anyone have any questions about Soul Matters small groups? Each group will decide amongst themselves when they wish to meet. They'll meet once a month. You'll meet once a month towards the end of each month. Can you choose which group you join or do you have to go over what? Oh, you, uh, the question was, um, can we, do we get to choose which group we're put in or do we get to go, do we get to choose where we want to go? And I just want to point out that that is a real good UU question. <laughs> So, um, so you would like to know all the participants' names ahead of time. Is that what you're saying? Well, if there's three groups, I'd prefer to be in a group with people who share my values. Okay, so what Ali said was if there's three groups, she'd prefer to be in a group that shares her values. We can talk about that. I'll work with the facilitators, and maybe what we'll do is do a little juggling. I mean, it's easier if we can put you into groups. Let's be honest. But, I mean... We can, we can play with that and massage it and talk about it, for sure. Any other questions about, so what I'm hearing often is that we don't know anything about Soul Matters. What is Soul Matters? What, is, what are we doing about Soul Matters? Where's the packet? So this is the second, no, third year we've done Soul Matters. Just a sec, Audrey. I'll, I'll come right to you. Uh, so this is the third year we've done Soul Matters theme-based ministry. There is a monthly theme that we follow, and we follow it from... The services, I, I conduct, I create the services with the theme in mind. Last year we started small group ministry, we had two groups going. This year we're hoping to expand small group ministry so that these Sunday services may be mean and are more valuable and enriching for you as well. And so, there. And the packet is available to you on every newsletter and on every e every email that comes out of the office on Fridays. Audrey. I just wanted to make a, a, an observation there. Because of my schedule not fitting with all the week, 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 I was still able to do some of the uh, uh, practice of my choice. And I found it very helpful. So you don't have to feel like you have to be there every minute. If something comes up, you can still uh, enjoy the uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase that um, at, at the mic because the people online, of course, can't hear. So what Audrey was saying was, yeah, I'm going to repeat it. Yeah, so, so what Audrey was saying is that just following along in the packets, there's videos, there's music um, playlists, there's readings, there's 
um, spiritual practices you can try, there's questions you can ponder, and you can do those whether or not you actually can make the, that month's meeting. So it doesn't, don't feel like you have to go to every single one. You can join a group and, and maybe that month you can't go, but there's still a lot of value in following along with the packets. They have a tremendous amount of um, beautiful material in them. So there we go. We're pushing Soul Matters pretty hard right now at the first this, this week. Um, Thanksgiving Sunday will be the last opportunity you have to, to sign up for a group. The groups close, right? So that you are able to develop close relationships and trust with the other members of your group. This is a chance to really, really go deep and uh, get to know one another on, on, a, on a more beautiful and, and enriching level. So the, clo- the groups do close on Thanksgiving Sunday. All right, I'm not asking for any more questions. <laughs> Where are we at, John? Um, you can go sit down. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so um, she's not going to let me in her group. Um, but <laughs> but uh, the service could not um, conduct today. It's not just Reverend Rosemary and myself here who were up speaking to you, but the whole group of people uh, were involved. Gordon Ritchie, Mark Booker, Declan Kiley, Andrew Mills, Suzanne, Susan Rattan, Jeff Pizantz, R- Ruth Marriott, Art Breyer, and Gertrude Janke. And thank all those people, and you can see what they did to help support the service in uh, the regular newsletter. Um, but we begin first now with a time of contemplation and music with this prelude, Autumn Leaves, which is miraculously named by someone named John. Uh, was, was written by someone named John, John Mercer and Autumn Leaves. So sit back and get into the mood for the next hour. Thank you, Gordon. Beautiful. One of my favorites. Has anybody heard the Autumn Leaves rendition by Eva Cassidy? Mm-hmm. Ooh, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? My name is Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor and privilege to serve 
this Unitarian Church of Edmonton. I am so blessed and honored to be with you this morning. I want to say a special welcome to the folks that are online. I hope you find the experience rewarding and fulfilling, and that we please let us know when we do and don't make this experience meaningful for you. I'd like to welcome all of you here. Thank you, John, for your for the opening. That was fun. Thank you, John, for that. That was fun. So we're going to have a fun morning this morning. I have some opening words by Reverend Bob Janice Dillon. You have come. You have come through these doors and into this place. You have come to be with others who care about what it, it, what it means to live on this beautiful blue-green world. You have come to be with your innermost self, to hear the deep wells within you brimming with courage and with vision. You have come to rest a while, rest in the divine silence to be renewed by not having to be anyone other than who you are, one small part of the eternal cosmos is what we all are. You have come to cry out, to rattle the walls that contain all the prisoners of injustice and greed and isolation. And when the time comes to tear down those walls, the world needs a few people who are honest, even to the point of accepting their imperfection. The world needs a few people who are brave enough to risk individual comfort, for the sake of a larger love. The world needs a few people who honor their own pain while simultaneously, be, simultaneously remaining open to the transformation of pain to wisdom and compassion. The world needs a few people that will step into the unknown carrying enough love to make things interesting. The world needs a few people who are ready to come alive. The sign-up sheets are not on the wall, but wait eternally within the human heart. Let us gather in peace, and let us make room for the infinite possibilities of the Spirit. Welcome to this hour and to this place. I'd like to invite John up for our chalice lighting. Thank you, Reverend Rosemary. Now for our traditional chalice lighting, and can I ask Audrey Brooks, given the theme of the day, she's someone who never changes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and can I uh, ask Audrey to light um, Light the chalice as I read um, these words. She's going to get me later. Um, come, come, whoever you are. You are welcome here. No matter your age, your size. Can someone run and get the other th candle thing for Audrey? This one came and went out, I think. Oh, the lit one. Yeah, just carry it over. That's great. Uh, you're... No matter your age, your size, the color of your eyes, your hair, your skin, you are welcome here. No matter how you came here, if you came alone or with others, you are welcome here. No matter whom you love or how you speak or whatever your abilities, you are welcome here. Whether you come with laughter in your heart or tears in your eyes, you are welcome here. If you come here with an open mind, a loving heart, and willing hands, thank you, then you are indeed welcome here. Can everyone rise as they're willing and able to sing hymn number 188, aptly titled, you guessed it, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. <laughs>
ink, I need a page turner. Fergie, there's a surprise. <laughs> you might need to stand above, like here, and uh, so. So I've got the words here, and you've got the pictures. And they will come up. Busy, the whole idea of the, the week or the daily family meal has gone out of the out of our thinking and being. I know for myself, eat, living alone and eating alone, uh, when I used to have a, a family, and one of the things we insisted on was that everybody sat down together at least once a day and had a meal together. But that doesn't happen all the time anymore, and sometimes I see kids at the playgrounds with their parents, and their parents are all like this, and the kids are like just staring at them, like, would you please just look at me? Please, just look at me. We need those connections. We need those times together. So this is wonderful that we can come together and be a community and get to know one another here. As family, we also come together with the Unitarian Church with our broader uh, community. If I ask the ushers, um, it's the time to uh, take the offering. Our community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. And so one of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. In addition to supporting this church community, we also make a monthly contribution beyond these walls, and one half of the identified cash that's received is given to an outside organization. Some are local, some national, some international. And for the month of September, we're sharing our abundance with Camp Firefly, which the Unitarian Church has had a long tradition and relationship with. And Audrey noted to me this morning, she's wearing her Camp, Fire, uh, Camp Firefly t-shirt. It's a leadership retreat for queer and trans youth aged 14 to 24. In a fun and social environment, campers develop skills that will positively impact their lives, homes, schools, and communities educational and art workshops, indigenous programming nature, and a supportive team create space for emerging change makers to learn, explore their identity, and build resilience. For those uh, in the sanctuary, thank you for all the, the gifts. Uh, and for those online, we encourage you to visit the Charity of the Month website and make a donation. And so thanks, the offering will now be received. Um, thanks very much. And now um, I get uh, an opportunity. Reverend Rosemary asked um, the time to have service leaders give a bit of reflection. And the early description was talking about welcoming change. Uh, and it struck me of something immediately went into my mind is about how we all resist and get anxious around changing circumstances. People new coming into our lives, new types of people, various things. And it's something that um, with the Im immigrants and various kind of things and the Unitarian Church has always been a place of acceptance. And there was a very uh, interesting speech that was written, this is not a new thing, a long time ago, and it was about some 600 years ago in medieval England, there was a xenophobia swept across the population. It's about 64,000 foreigners from the wealthy Lombard bankers uh, to Flemish laborers arrived on the English shores between 1330 and 1550, uh, and they were seeking better lives from the continent and coming to England. Huge resistance. The locals blamed them for taking their jobs, for distorting their culture. Tensions reached a zenith on May 1st, 1517, as riots broke out in London and a mob armed with stones, bricks, bats, boots, and boiling water attacked the immigrants, looted their homes, 
And Thomas More, then the city's deputy sheriff, tried to reason with the crowd. And this dark day in history known as Evil May Day was portrayed in a then banned play called The Book of Sir Thomas More. And it was written between 1596 and 1601. And actually it was recently, well not that recently, a while ago discovered there were three writers who combined to write on it. One was William Shakespeare. And it's the only piece of actual handwriting of him writing a particular play is sections of the play. And they didn't determine which one, but they're pretty sure, all the scholars, about the 147 lines of Moore's speech, which was Thomas Moore speaking to the crowd of London's attacking the new immigrants. And it was never performed in Shakespeare's lifetime because the Queen's censor, Edmund Tilney, thought it might incite riots during the time when England was again besieged during that time by another immigrant crisis of the French-speaking Protestant asylum seekers from France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. So these waves of resistance. And so the wretched strangers have changed, of course, from the Lombards attacked in 1517 in those riots, to the Huguenot refugees in Shakespeare's time, to the Syrians, Iraqis, South Sudanese, Eritreans, and others fleeing repressive governments in our current time. And so the location of this speech and play took just outside St. Martin's in the Field Church, which if you visited England is Trafalgar Square is where it took place, and there was a plane, it was a rural plane, and the crowd shouts out, remove them, remove them. That's what they wanted these immigrants to go. And Thomas More stood up and said, grant them removed, and grant that this your noise hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs and their poor luggage, plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silent by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed. What did you got? I'll tell you, you had taught how insulin and strong hands should prevail, how order should be quelled, and by this pattern not one of you should live an aged man. For other ruffians as their fancies wrought with self-same hands, self-masons, and self-right would shark on you, and men like ravenous fishes would feed on one another. Say now the king should so much come too short of your great trespass as but to banish you. Whither would you go? What country, by the nature of your error, should give you harbor? Go to France or Flanders, to any German province, to Spain or Portugal, nay, anywhere that not adheres to England. Why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth? Wet their detested knives against your throat, spurn you like dogs, and like as if that God owed not nor made not you, nor that the claimants were not all appropriate to your comforts, but charted upon them? What would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case. And this is your mountainous inhumanity. It's a simple message. And I might echo with something more modern, which was, I was watching last week, which was Ricky Gervais' Afterlife. <laughs> which is worth a look, in which someone says, happiness is a wonderful thing. It doesn't matter if it's yours or not. <laughs> Society goes great when old men plant trees they will never sit under. Good people do good things for other people, full stop, the end. Let us all join in singing hymn 331, Life is the greatest gift of all.
that wasn't smart, leaving this up here on the wrong page. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, John, for that. It was awesome. Welcoming change. And I sort of morphed it over into talking about building bigger tables and thinking about tables and all that kind of thing. So it kind of got massaged a little bit since September when I decided what we were going to talk about today. So I have a little reading by Sasha Martin. Build a bigger table, not a higher wall. When you have more than you need, bigger, bigger, build a bigger table, not a higher wall, not a higher fence. A little while back, I shared this meme on Facebook, and I don't know if you remember during COVID, or maybe it was the Syrian refugee crisis that was going all over Facebook. Build, build a longer table, not a higher wall. So she says, a little while back, I shared this meme on Facebook. I went to, to bed and didn't think very much of it. But just a few days later, 1.75 million people had viewed it. It was clear that I'd stumbled onto the pulse of something enormous. What was happening? Why did so many people see, share, and like this simple statement? I have a few theories. We're tired of living in a boxed-in world. Our fence is as tall as the rest of them, she says. Presumably, tall fences exist so that we can water our plants in our jammies. I'll admit, there's something freeing about lounging in my robe while sipping a cup of tea, secure in the knowledge that no one has to shield their children from my fuzzy slippers. <laughs> but this comfort comes as a, at a cost. Tall fences interrupt casual encounters with our neighbors. And so does driving into my parkade and going up the elevator, I'm noticing. I haven't really been in my new neighborhood very much. So those 15-minute chats that start with trivial banter about the weather, they can end with impromptu barbecues and deep friendship. If it weren't for the bearded boys, she called her neighbors, our old neighbors who insisted on lugging their dining room table to their front yard and declared backyards and fences the worst. We probably, in our family, would not have thought twice about the solitude our fence provided. We are craving connection. With our thumbs sore from scanning our phones and our necks stiff, necks stiff from Netflix, say that 10 times fast, <laughs> the idea of filling an enormous table with food, friends, and lively chatter can feel completely overwhelming. So many people express loneliness on social media but avoid making the phone call that could result in a meaningful gathering. Why? Because it's hard. Risking rejection is scary. Families are more spread out than ever. As we spread out around the country and globe, we're further, farther from our families than ever. The memes, vision, my daughter calls them memes. Nobody else does that, do they? No, no. She's hilarious. The memes, vision of an enormous table full of laughter, conversation, and chaos creates nostalgia for a family who may never have, but always wanted or for a family we once had, but have since moved away. We need less isolation, more community, and greater feasts for all. And we can start by making room in our hearts. Go ahead, risk rejection, make a few calls, tear down those fences, metaphorically, Build a bigger table. It's worth it. End of quote. When I was reading about this, when I was reading this and typing it in, I, I, I couldn't help but think about my time this summer in Whitehorse. As many of you know, I spent a month in Whitehorse with my daughter, who says Mimi, 
uh, and her husband and their two children. Teo is going to be four next week, and and Etienne is almost is seven months now. Whitehorse is a city of about 30,000 people, and it is the largest city in the Yukon Territory. While I was visiting my daughter and her family, it quickly became apparent to me that because of the nature of the city, it's not Edmonton, you had to figure out and make your own fun. I was very surprised and a little put out, to be honest, at first, at the number of times we were invited over to a friend's house for dinner, or they were invited to our house, and all of a sudden, I was cooking for more <laughs> than I had planned on. I got used to it, and it became really fun. And I discovered that things could, didn't have to be perfect, and it could be impromptu. And it could be because three-year-olds began planning our social calendars for us. <laughs> My grandson would say, I want to play with so-and-so. And the next thing you know, we were having dinner with so-and-so's parents. And we brought this, and they brought that, and things just happened, and wow. And it happened a lot. And like I said, at first, annoyingly so. And then I got used to it. And then my need for a perfectly planned out dinner party that results in not very many dinner parties <laughs> keeps me from having more get-togethers and fun. That's one of the reasons why I've started the get-togethers on the kind of the middle Friday of, of every month. I'm calling it Fridays are for food and fun. I'm simply going to make a pot of soup. You can join me. And bring something to share if you want, or you can just bring yourself. And maybe next time you can bring something or not. And maybe, just maybe, gathering around the table in community once a month after a stressful work week, or just to mark the start of a weekend, will help us feel less isolated. It could help us feel less lonely, help us scroll a little less on that day. I just want you to know I scroll too much. And it might even result in some meaningful conversation and some enriched relationships. As Sasha Martin says, we need less isolation, more community, and greater feasts for all. I've heard people say, what about Soup Sundays? Can we do Soup Sundays again? That would be fun. That would be great. And I say, please, let's do Soup Sundays. Feel free to organize it, get a team. Let me know. I'll go. We all will. But I'm not able to do that. It's not something I can take on, and no one's taking it on right now. As you might guess, my Sundays are a little busy. So I won't be doing Soup Sundays. But I am going to do Fridays are for food and fun. So I'm going to make a pot of soup, I'll put some t games out, but you don't have to play a board game if you don't want to. So have you heard that Octavia Butler quote, which was kind of the impetus for this, the beginning thinking around this service? Octavia Butler wrote, everything you touch, you change. Everything you change, changes you. The only everlasting truth is change. Life is change. When we decide that we are willing to welcome some change into our lives, be it impromptu barbecues or shoveling your neighbor's walk, be it getting to know, even getting to know our neighbors better like the bearded boys Sasha Martin told us about, or getting more involved in this or other communities you belong to, or deciding to talk to someone on a Sunday morning that you don't know very well, or staying for coffee and visiting after the service instead of rushing off, or finding out how to support new Canadians in your community, or anything else you can think of, you will be changed by it. My hope is that as we become used to visiting more with each other, we will become more welcoming in general in our lives. 
in just a few minutes, we're going to break into small groups and talk with each other for a couple of minutes, not too long. Don't expect to get out of here at 11.30, just saying. I'm just looking at the time. We're having too much fun. We're not going to get out on time. So to prepare for this conversation that you will have with one another, I invite you to think about a time you felt perfectly welcomed into a community. It could have been a meeting you went to, or a conference, or your first day at work, or a new choir, or here, or another church on a Sunday morning. What happened? What were some of the elements that made you feel welcomed, made you feel at ease? Got rid of that, those butterflies and that anxiety that happens the first time we try something new. What did the organizers do or say? Going into strange situations can be scary. What did this group do to make you feel comfortable? For those of you on Zoom, Andrew's going to pop you into Zoom rooms to chat with one another. Probably stopping the recording at this time is also a, a good idea. So here's the thing. We're going to just turn to our neighbor. You can have groups of two or three. We're going to, as I'm talking, you're thinking about a time when you started something new. And that group made you feel perfectly at ease. Can you think of something? And then just share it with your neighbor. How are we doing? All right. I w Welcome back, everyone. I'd like to conclude this time together with a quote by a person named Peace Pilgrim. She was born in 1908 and died in 1981. And she became a person that walked and walked across the continent saying that peace is what we need to have. And that's what she called herself was Peace Pilgrim. She went without money. She just had the clothes on her back. She didn't have a backpack, nothing. She just walked and walked and walked advocating for peace. And she says, all of us all over the world are cells in the body of humanity. You are not separate from your fe fellow humans and you cannot find harmony uh, for yourself alone. You can only find harmony when you realize the oneness of all and work for the good of all. As we think about all we've heard so far and what we learned from one another, I invite us to take a moment, a breath, and sit back and relax and watch this video by Carrie Newcomer. The, the song is Room at the Table. Does anybody know Carrie Newcomer besides me? Carrie Newcomer, please look her up. Fabulous, fabulous musician. She works with the um, Quaker spiritual leader, Parker Palmer, uh, and she too is a Quaker. So if you're watching on YouTube, the video is going to stop again, and, um, but it's Carrie Newcomer, uh, Room at the Table. Look it up. It's worth watching. And if we can, here we go. Turn off the chancel about that. So we just... Um, if we want to watch videos and, and things that are copyrighted, we have to turn the recording off. We can't put them up on our YouTube channel. And that's okay. At One by Victoria Stafford. I'm going to read this, and then we're going to move into our uh, meditation hymn, uh, which is hymn number 127. No, 1037. We begin in love. Normally I read this two or three times, but probably I'll just read it the once. And so in preparation for this, I invite you to just take a couple of deep breaths, center yourself, plant your feet on the floor, get comfortable in your chair. Imagine this, on the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is now every fall, Every year, the people make their peace with anyone they have wronged or slighted or injured or in any way neglected in the past 12 months. 
The task is not to patch things up, smooth things over, reach a compromise, or sweep mistakes and uneasy memories under the rug. The task is not to feel better. The task is ownership. The goal is truth for its own redemptive sake. I did this. I said this to you, and it was wrong. I neglected something. I botched something else. I betrayed you thusly. I demeaned you whether you ever knew it or not. I ask you to forgive me. Imagine how many breaths you would need to take. Imagine how many doors you'd have to knock on, how many phone calls you'd have to make, how many letters, how many lunches and coffees, how many awkward moments with your children and your parents and with stranger like that cashier to whom you spoke so sharply. Awkward is irrelevant. The task is not about comfort, it is about truth, about wholeness and holiness, restoration, imagination. Something yearns in us to come round right, something creaky, rusty, heavy, almost calcified within us tries, in spite of us and of all our fears and self-deceptions, to turn, and turn and creak and turn again and come round a little truer. Something in us stretch, stretches toward compassion. Just take a few moments of silence and then Gordon will bring us into hymn number 1037. And I need You could play through the part that the congregation sings, and then I will read the affirmations. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible. For each time we have struck out in anger without just cause. for each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others. For the selfishness that sets us apart, sets us apart and alone. For falling short of the admonitions of the Spirit. For losing sight of our unity. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which we have fueled, which have fueled the illusion of separateness. Thank 
you. And as we carry this time of feeling, just thinking about some of these things, about welcome, about change, about building a bigger table, about creating new community, I invite you to light candles, whoops, sorry, and light candles of care and concern, joy, contemplation, anything that happens to be in your heart. And after we finish that, we will we're going to skip this last hymn and move into extinguishing the flame. So if you are new and haven't done this, don't go first, just follow what other people do. <laughs> Thank you, John. John is lighting a last candle for all those thoughts and concerns, joys, celebrations that maybe we haven't acknowledged with lighting a candle or that maybe we haven't even realized is there. We haven't finished those thoughts. To look at these candles and this light and know that each one of them is something that is real to us. Let us hold each other in love and in care as we build community with one another. And now, and I just wanted to say, I was very, I thought to myself, oh, I'm keeping these people way too long. And probably only a couple of people will come up and light candles because you want to leave. But oh, 
No, you did not. So I don't feel bad anymore. <laughs> so we're going to skip the last hymn, Love Will Guide Us, and John is going to, uh, um, in a moment, uh, read the Coachella's extinguishing words. But I wanted to also say that I forgot to say something about Soul Matters. Pauline is leading a Soul Matters info session in the library right after church. So get your coffee and meet with Pauline in the library, in the library, if you have any questions or wish to sign up for Soul Matters. John. Thank you, uh, Reverend Rosemary. And now I ask um, Andre Brooks, uh, someone who has changed my life. Uh, to extinguish the uh, candle as I recite these words. Uh, a First Step Faith by Reverend Scott Taylor. Go with faith, not the kind that is called to move mountains, but the quieter sort that calls us to take the first step. Even when the whole staircase sits beyond our view, and as we move toward the unseen, may we notice that the way unfolds only as we risk traveling it. And may we remember and trust that on this journey, we are never alone. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, John. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for being online. Thank you for everyone that participated and contributed to this service. And now, I invite you in this form of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Everything can break and everything can be mended, but not with time, as they say, it's with intention. So go now into the world and love intentionally and love extravagantly and love unconditionally for the broken world waits in darkness for your light to shine upon the world. Go in peace, gentle people, go in peace, amen. And now we will sing our linking song and then afterwards we can have some coffee and maybe a snack. Pay for <laughs> I'm <laughs> 